and we can start a new chapter, I would say, about uh, the front end, uh, the browser, what happens in the browser. So until now, <clears throat> we have been developing in Node.js on the server with the scripting language just to learn the basics of the language itself. Of course, our goal would be to develop uh, applications that run into, into a, uh, the browser, okay? This is, a, and, um, this is where things uh, will get complicated because we have a very uh, complex architecture with different pieces that can be exploited in different ways uh, uh, to manage. Mm -hmm. um, this is a simplified view of the modern architecture for web applications. Uh, basically, we have the main player here that is the browser. So, and the browser can, of course, uh, uh, display content. And today we will play with HTML and CSS just to um, get a good understanding of how, how the static content is, is displayed. Uh, while next week we'll uh, learn also how JavaScript is running inside the browser. So the browser is a, is a complex environment uh, in which, uh, first of all, it can parse some declaration language like HTML and CSS and turn it into a visualization, into something that can be browsed and viewed by the user, and what, where the user can interact. But also, and especially in the, in the current times, the browser is a container for the runtime environment of JavaScript. So once we have the description of a web page, we can add the functionality to that web page through JavaScript code. And uh, it would be important uh, to understand the interface between the HTML, let's say the web page, and the JavaScript code. And this interface is a set of API that are called the, the DOM, the Document Object Model. Okay? So our JavaScript code will interact actually with the browser and will interact with the, web, with the content of the web page through this DOM interface. And will react to the user actions through some objects uh, that are events uh, inside this DOM API. Okay, so learning to program JavaScript inside the browser basically means learning the API of the DOM, of the document object model, which gives us everything we can do, we are allowed to do, uh, to interact with the page. Okay, we, we build the page with HTML, CSS, and so, and then we can modify or make it add the behaviors uh, with JavaScript uh, interacting with the DOM. Today, we'll try to play with this part, so we'll only build the static pages, and next week, uh, we'll add the JavaScript and DOM to the same pages. This is on the front end. So, what we need only to create a dynamic experience uh, of, a, of a web page is just these three languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They will be loaded by a browser, and they can do whatever they want on a web page. Of course, the issue is uh, uh, what is the actual content of this page? The actual content of the page, so for example, we have in our example the QA website, okay? The list of questions. Where does it come from? If we are writing HTML by hand, uh, the only possibility to write a question inside the HTML, of course, is not a viable solution. We should find a way to dynamically generate the HTML. And this leads us to the traditional web applications where the HTML is generated dynamically in the server. Where is that? Here, in the server, where upon navigating to a page, the server will execute some code that will generate the HTML. This is one possibility. Okay? And then, so, uh, the knowledge about uh, the question and answers is in the server that, of course, will query some database or whatever and create an HTML page tailored with current information. And then the JavaScript can add some interaction, some stuff. Or the alternative is that we are going to explore in this course is uh, the HTML only contains uh, an empty table the framework, the skeleton, 
of the page. And the actual content will be filled in by the front-end code, by the JavaScript code. So basically, in this HTML, we will have an empty page, or nearly empty, and then we run the JavaScript code, and JavaScript code will start building the, the page and add the information. But while the server can query the database because they are on the server side, they are together, so it can access the real data, the JavaScript code that runs in the browser of a user that is on the other side of the world, of course, will not be able to connect to our database. Our database is the most protected part of our application architecture. And so how can the JavaScript code fill the information inside the page? Of course, it cannot do, it cannot query directly the database, but it could ask the server to provide the, the data. The data, the raw data, the strings, the numbers, that it can use to put them into a nice interface. So, uh, in both cases, the information comes from the server through this HTTP channel. In the first case, on this channel, we get, let's say, a fully built HTML page with traditional web applications. And this, in the second case, with the so-called single-page applications, or there are, there are many, names, very many names for that, we are using this channel first for getting a basically empty page or a skeleton, and then we are using the same channel to get raw data. So we are always using the HTTP protocol, both to transfer HTML and to transfer data in the JSON format, normally in the JSON format because it's the easiest format to transfer uh, objects and lists uh, as strings over a serial channel, and it's very natural to use in, in, in JavaScript. Okay, it's a normal format for, for transferring, transferring data. So in this case, it's the JavaScript application on the browser that asks for the server bits and pieces of information and puts them together into the page. So all the logic for building the, the page and the application is uh, uh, in the client. The browser itself today is a very complex uh, environment, okay? Uh, the, lines, the number of lines of code in a modern browser is more than an operating system, just to make a comparison. Uh, and it, it's no longer the traditional stuff that does uh, um, the user interface from an HTML, but it will put together Con, uh, optimizing the network connection, all the interpreter, all the, uh, let's say, interaction with the, uh, with the operating system for rendering the page and so on, mm. and, uh, and a lot of uh, different APIs. Mm. So uh, we, what, of course, every browser is different. What we will learn is that how to interact from within our JavaScript code with, the different, uh, with some of the different components of the browser itself. The browser offers a set of APIs, the DOM is one, but it's only, not the only one, that will allow us to, to do things and to exploit the functionality of the browser. By the way, the, the DOM will spend some time next week uh, in basically a tree of nodes, of objects, that represent the different parts uh, of, of the HTML elements. So when we learn HTML and we nest uh, elements, uh, what we are doing is actually building a tree of JavaScript objects that constitute the DOM, and these objects have a, have a set of methods, a set of functionality and properties that we can manipulate in our code to, to modify the page. Okay. Um, of course, on the server side, uh, that's why also we played a bit with the SQLite, normally in, all, uh, in addition to the server that handles the logic here and uh, does the query, the, the remote APIs, we have some sort of persistence. And in this course, we are going to use uh, SQLite on the server side, okay? So SQLite the database will always be on the server side and the application will be on the client side. So basically the comparison I was doing before is uh, summarized by, by this picture here. 
um, in both cases we have the browser and we have the user interacting with the browser no? we have our little user here and there that only sees the user interfaces provided by the browser the difference is in the role of uh, basically or where do we put uh, the application logic uh, and the logic building the interface building the page in the traditional sense uh, uh, the web server contains all the logic for our application and it will generate basically uh, the fragments of the page or the complete HTML pages a complete page or a part of the page that will be put together so it's the server that decides uh, what goes into the page and basically it goes you know, basically straight to the interface the JavaScript engine here uh, is not uh, well I would say not fundamental it may be there or may only do maybe a little work uh, maybe aesthetical for interaction but the core of the logic uh, lies in the server okay we could also do without this JavaScript if we want the server can generate all the content that we that we want and then the user clicks somewhere and the server will regenerate a page and ship it ship it to the browser as a new page of course for making things more interactive and also more performant uh, we want to help uh, the browser and we want to do something asynchronous asynchronously on the browser itself okay uh, in the so-called single page application spa what happens is that uh, the basically logic in the server disappears so all the logic uh, will be here as moved here inside the browser so we are building a very large javascript application very large significantly larger than before javascript application so when we connect a website built built with this architecture on the first load we are, what we are getting is a nearly empty page plus a big chunk of javascript and this big chunk of javascript is our application and we start running and building the page so the the title the content the table the figures in the page don't are not built by the web server but are built inside here that we manipulate the DOM to populate the page and whenever this JavaScript needs some information to build this page so maybe the title we already know the colors the icons we already know but maybe the messages we don't know the actual question and answers and so we go and ask to the server the information that we need so basically the um, server mainly pro doesn't provide the logic it basically provides an API for accessing application program interface you know, an API for accessing data or modifying data an API that wraps in a way gives me access to the data layer to the data layer so behind this we have data so the API the data which are stored of course in the database in the server side and for accessing the data the server will give me an API that we still run over HTTP of course of the HTTP proxy because the only way oh it's not the only way but basically the uh, nearly the only way that the browser and the server can communicate with each other is through HTTP calls the difference is that these HTTP calls don't give me part of the web page they only give me data and it's up to the client to build the page okay it's a it's a shift in responsibility in a way we are exploiting the fact that the browsers are faster and faster and so all the computation related to the user interface can be done inside the browser and the server is only there for serving data um, this is also very useful if we want to build a, a mobile application that of course we run on your uh, smartphone and can exploit 
the same API calls of a web application. So in this way, you can manage a web interface and a mobile interface at the same time because we only define once the APIs and then of course you build two totally different interfaces. In one case, you are writing JavaScript. In the other case, maybe you're writing um, Java or Kotlin uh, or uh, no, if you are building on Android, for example. But you share part of the data protection logic and the data, data access logic, while the interface logic is separated because you have different presentation means. What is happening in this? Uh, but of course, in this core, we are focusing on this part here. Okay. What is happening in these years, the last couple of years, is that the two philosophies are trying to join together, to join forces. And we are starting to see shifts in the you know, single page application that uh, say, okay, but why do we need uh, to exploit the processing power in the browser for maybe some information which is always the same? Or why do we need an extra complication of uh, HTTP calls to define APIs uh, when we could have some logic running here and some logic running there? So what is happening right now is that they are trying to build application in this way. A big part of logic is in the browser, but also part of the logic is in the server. And we run some components in the server, some components in the browser, depending on what they need to do. If they need to interact with the user, we put them in, in, the, in the client. If they need to interact with the server, of course, uh, with the data, we put them in the server, and there will be a, it's not automatic, that we will have some frameworks here, a framework, so a, set of big, a big set of libraries that will manage the communication between the two parts. So we are writing a set of components, uh, and some will run in the server, some will run in the client, uh, we choose and all the so, um, value passing between these components is already managed by the by the rules of the framework okay we are not going into this direction right now but uh, it's what uh, is the current state of application and it's a you know uh, it's a full range you can you could have a, an application where 90 percent is here or an application where 90 percent is there hmm? depends uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, what you see is that we don't need the, the API anymore. It's not really true. No? We will need it in some way, but in some ways hidden behind the framework mechanism. Hmm? Uh, so if you want, af after the end of the course, if you want uh, to have a look at how things are progressing, right now we are only, in this course, we are only putting 100% here and uh, we are forgetting, basically forgetting about uh, uh, the other part, okay? Okay, so uh, I'm not here to give you, you know, uh, a lecture on uh, the HTML tags, of course. Uh, you already had some, some reading and something that is better uh, to have a look uh, on, uh, on, your, on your own. Uh, what we are trying to do is maybe to build building something together and so we take the opportunity of an exercise for maybe pointing out some of the key points uh, in designing uh, front-end content. Okay, so for the moment, let's forget about all of this JavaScript. Uh, let's go back to static HTML written by hand. Okay, so we are going back uh, 20 years, but we need to start somewhere. And what we try to do is, for example, the exercise which is proposed here, where we want to start uh, drawing a first uh, skeleton of the question and answer website, okay? So right now we just play with the data. Uh, let's try to put some data on the screen. So the idea, the, the minimum uh, that we could do is to have uh, two, two pages. One, that we show a table with a list of all questions that have been asked. And uh, 
the second page with, that will only show the detail of a single question. So the, the answers given to a single question. So imagine a first page with all the questions, you select one of them, and you go to a second page where you have that single question with all the answers listed there. Okay. And so, of course, there are links uh, from one page to the other. Hmm? Uh, this is, will be the structure, the minimum structure of this application. Of course, everything will be dynamic, uh, so the list of questions will come from the database, the list of answers will come from the database, but for the moment, we're writing them by hand. Okay? We'll, we'll get there in, in, in some steps. Uh, let's uh, maybe start uh, by designing the second page, the one with the answer, because it's a bit more interesting, okay? There's a bit more information to be shown. And uh, we thought of a sort of a mock-up of this interface. We want something that looks like this, more or less. This, of course, is handwritten. So we have, uh, okay, the the first, uh, the, the, the page that contains the title and uh, on the top and the footer on the bottom. And inside the page we have the question, the text of the question that is being displayed on this page, the author, and the table with the list of current answers. And an answer we know is uh, composed of uh, basically data, author, the answer text, uh, and the score value. So we have this table that displays in a graphical tabular way the content of the um, of our answers. And of course we need to provide for some interactivity in the real page. For example, what can we do on a List of answers, well, if we are logged into this, well, on the, into the website, we could vote for the question, for the answer. Okay, up vote or down vote. For the moment, let's th only think about up voting. So I provide my vote. Uh, if I, are, I haven't already voted, I can cast a vote on that answer. I could uh, sort the question, the answers. Maybe I could sort them by date or sort them by, by score. It's something that can be added interactively. And they can maybe provide my own answer. So one way is having some text fields in which I can write my answer and click on add. Well, maybe not really like this because it's not fair if I, I should not be able to, to give myself a score. So this should, be, should not be there. Okay, I, when I post a new uh, answer, it will start with zero score. So it's not a, some value that, that I can provide. And also maybe the date is something that will be inserted automatically by the system. Hmm? But this is just for uh, uh, imagining the user interface. What do we have here? We have titles, we have text, we have tables, we have interactive elements. And we have some layout rules. This is on top, this is in the center, this is in the bottom, and so on. We need to uh, design all of this uh, in uh, a static HTML page. So for the moment, uh, none of these actions that they described will work. So we have a, maybe a button, and we, when we click on this button, nothing happens. We know that we would like to sort by score, but for the moment we cannot do that. So we are not able to do that yet because it will only be a static page, okay? We are adding dynamic behavior in the next week. Uh, the web page must be static with no interactive features. And so the data about the answers will be hard coded in our HTML source, of course. We don't have anything else at the moment. Okay, so uh, let's start with a new file that can be answers.html. Okay, we are creating here in the folder exercise file, a new file, answers.html, where we are statically building the page. Um, 
there is uh, an abbreviation in Visual Studio Code that if you type HTML, it will already have some templates ready for you. In this case, HTML5, we create this template code. Um, that already gives us the basic structure of an HTML page, where, of course, we have some heading section, where the main content is the title of the page. Of course, the title is not, sorry, is not what is displayed here inside the page. The title is what's displayed on the browser bar. Okay. So when we are navigating on, uh, I don't have a browser open yet. Sorry, I, I lost. Okay. So the title could be you and I website. And the real content of the page is inside the body of the page itself. In HTML, what we are writing is basically, yes? Yeah, you just write uh, HTML and then you select HTML5 and press enter. Okay. Um, okay, all the content is inside the body of the page. And it's basically text with tags that uh, specify the role of this text. So basically, we may have uh, headings of the page. So heading one, two, three are the titles of the page. For example, we want to write uh, let's, the name of website. Uh, well, it's called the Heap of Run, which is a, a, a game on Stack Overflow. And then we may have uh, the question text. Uh, so one of the questions. Uh, which may be just a paragraph of text uh, is uh, JavaScript better than Python? And then we have the author, so it can be another paragraph of text, uh, which is the uh, Russis who created this question. And then we have a list of answers that can be a table. Sorry. I can have a small title, maybe a title of level two answers. And then I have a table with the different uh, answers. Maybe I can write just some placeholder just to have a first preview. One, two, three. So what I'm creating is a simple text file. Um, no, sorry. And I can open this text file directly with the browser. So if I click on the HTML, I will get a very ugly page with this content. So what I specify in the title attribute in the head goes into the tab name, and all the rest will be listed here. Okay. It's just text at the moment with a default font, with a default color, and with some structure in the text. So you see that we, what I use the, the P tag is the for paragraphs normal paragraph of text, uh, what I use the, as a H1 and H2 are titles, headings of level one, level 1 and level 2 that are formatted in a different way. And uh, all of these can be represented as text, but actually we should start imagining that it's actually a tree of elements. Because we have an HTML tag at the beginning that has two children, head and body. 
and inside the body we have a title h1 and inside this title h1 we have some text and then we have other children which is a paragraph of text that contains text and so on so we are creating in a textual format a nested set of text that will correspond to objects so the browser will read that and build that tree keep in mind because that tree is uh, the one that will be using in JavaScript. Of course, in JavaScript we will never deal with this text uh, as a string, as a, as a file, because that would be impossible to handle. We will work on this uh, parsed tree of content, which is the DOM, what we call the DOM before. Uh, we're writing text, and up to now, the tags that we used where all tags like h1, h1, p, and h2, and so on, that formatted the text uh, in a vertical way. So every time I open a new paragraph, I will open a new line. Every time I write a um, heading, I'm opening a new line. Uh, we are in some way controlling the layout algorithm inside the browser. So the browser will try to put on the page all the content it will give according to two main positioning algorithms. And these positioning algorithms depend on the type of blocks that we are adding, or the type of tag that we are adding, sorry, of tag that we are adding. Uh, these are the two main we will learn more, okay, for doing more complex layouts. But the normal layout is done by combining two rules. Some elements uh, have a block rule. Block means uh, op uh, occupying the full width of the, of the page and the uh, different block level elements will go one below the other. A paragraph is a block, a title is a block, and they go one below the other. Other elements have uh, an inline layout algorithm. In line means uh, like the words in a paragraph, from left to right, side by side. And when we reach the, the margin of the page, we just continue on the next line. So there are some elements that normally create new blocks, and so create new lines in the page. Other elements uh, create, don't create new blocks, uh, they just, uh, let's say, go side by side on the same line. For example, if we want uh, to put in boldface, for example, the author name, we could uh, uh, add uh, a strong tag, tag. Okay, and uh, if we reload the page in the browser, we see that this goes into boldface. And we see that we have a tag here, strong, that doesn't go onto a new line, because strong is an inline element. So we continue on the same line. So we can nest and mix the elements as we like, just remember this layout rule. If we want to put uh, um, the name of the question and the name of the author on the same line, for example, we should, not, we should not use paragraphs because if you have two paragraphs, there are two block level elements and they go one below the other, not one uh, next to the other. Unless we are modifying the layout algorithms, which is what we are going to do. So these are just the default arguments for layout. A paragraph is a block level element. Uh, both face element is an inline one, an image is in line, and so on. But we will be able, we will learn how to modify all these properties to move stuff around. So we'll try to, uh, we'll try to, let's say, se separate the content that we want on the page from the layout in which we want it to be displayed. Of course, there will be some mix between the two, but the CSS language allows us to take some content and position it 
or in a different way on the page hmm? and uh, by using the styles. So what are the block level elements? So HTML defines a set of block level elements uh, that are us usually for defining parts of the page. There are some sectioning elements that are op they are all optional. We saw, for example, the headings, uh, but we can also define a header of the foot of the page. So, for example, what we had here in the heap of the title is part of what we imagine to be the header of the page. So, a good uh, suggestion would be to mark this part the other is the header of the page itself. So the header will contain this, will contain this title. When I'm adding some heading, and so uh, the main body of the page could be uh, article, for example, or main. So I sorry, why, I don't know why I didn't list main in this uh, um, element. So the main content of the, of the page will be this one. Main is this part. And then we may have a footer at the end. For the moment, uh, we don't know what to write, maybe copyright or web application one, two, five, and 23. So we are, in some way, structuring the page by putting all these elements into their own blocks. And the HTML doesn't change at all. So what we are doing is that we are adding some container elements across the code that have no visible effect right now. But we will be able to use them for formatting or laying out in a different way the different parts of the page. So we try to give some structure of the page for marking with this text different parts of the page. And then we decide maybe to change the background color of the header or to position in a different way the footer or to center the main content or whatever. This is separate. Right now we are marking by saying this is the header of the page and later on we'll say, we'll describe how to format the header of the page. Hmm? All of these comments have no visible, except for the titles, H1, H3, H3, have no visible effect on the page. They are, but they are used for creating sections in the code that will make our lives easier later on. And then we have all the other tags. These are the main tags for the block level elements. And the two most important one is a paragraph of text that is used to contain actual text. And also another element which is uh, invisible. So it doesn't have any layout effect, any real layout effect. And since it doesn't have any predefined semantics, it's the one of the most useful elements because we can apply our own rules to that element. The paragraph of text already has some margins, some forms, some rules you know, for, for formatting. A div doesn't have any rules by itself, and we can specify different uh, parts of the, of, of the page, how they behave, by enclosing them into divs and giving different uh, styles to this div. So it's a sort of an anonymous container that we can customize. All the other have some, some role, of course some already predefined uh, uh, formatting. So for example, uh, UL and OL are for creating lists uh, of elements uh, with numbers or with bullets. Uh, um, HR is for creating a line across the page and so on. All of these are block level elements, meaning that when we insert one of these elements, we are by default formatting them from top to bottom. While for uh, inline elements, so left to right layout, we have this set of tags, which are the main ones. Okay, I put in red the ones that we will use more. 
uh, as is for creating links, uh, image for inserting images, uh, uh, emphasis, italics, bold, and uh, span. That is uh, similar to div. Span doesn't have any predefined meaning. So we can use it to mark some part of the text with an inline layout, so without breaking the lines. And this text will be formatted in a, in a, in a separate way that will decide with style sheets. There are also some texts that are mostly in line for creating interactive behavior. So text inputs, buttons, uh, calendar widgets, uh, drop-down lists, uh, and so on. And they are all part of the big family of form elements. Okay? They're all in line, but they only are the only ones that have a predefined interactive behavior. All of the rest are just for displaying information. The only interactive elements are links, buttons, and then in basically input elements uh, that are text, uh, buttons, checkboxes, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And are all part of, of this family. Uh, there are some other formatting structures, uh, for example, for creating tables. So we have a textual syntax for creating a table, and this is what we we want to do right now for creating a table with the answers of our users. And um, so let's try to apply this uh, or to create a table with the answers using the table tag. Table by itself uh, is, uh, is not listed here is an inline element, uh, but of course we want to put that into a separate line by itself. So we, instead of writing the answers like this, we can create a section, a block section, so we use a div so that the table stands on its own block, it doesn't have anything on the side, and uh, create a table. The table as two sections, one with the titles and the other with the contents, normally. So we have a table heading and a table body. Table heading normally contains a row with the titles of the columns. Okay, the table heading, T head, let's try to make it larger. The head uh, is for this section here in the table. And is made by the heading of the table may contain one, two, three, some rows at the beginning. In this case, we, all, we only have one. Okay? So every part of the table is composed of rows, and every row is composed of cells. <coughs> so in the heading, we have one row. The tag for a table row is TR table row that contains uh, how many? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, five columns, five cells containing titles. So these are called the table headings, TH. And we copy the picture. We, the first one will be labeled data. The second one will be labeled uh, text author score. Text, th, author, score. And then we have uh, actions at the end. So right now we created a table and we added one row to this table. And it looks like this. Table is a layout element. It's not a visible in the element. So we don't see all the cells. We don't see all the lines in the table right now, because by default, uh, the table element doesn't show them. Okay. If we want, uh, for the moment, we can just, for helping us, 
we can add a border equal to one, which gives uh, some very bad looking uh, aspect of the table, but at least we, we know, we see where, are the, where the cells are. Okay, so right now we are in the ugly mode of HTML. Just raw content using the default uh, presentation style. Then we will learn uh, some CSS for styling this content better in a more acceptable way, okay? Both from the point of view of the layout and from the point of view of the colors, fonts, and so on. So for the moment, let's keep this way so that we can see the cells, where the cells are. And this is the heading. And the body is made in the same way. It's made of several, uh, several rows, table rows. Each row has, again, five cells, which in this case are data, TD, table data. The difference between H is a heading, so it's formatted in bold, basically, and the D stands for data, which is a normal content of the table. So we have a date here, so it will be today, maybe, 2023. 0321. The second is the text of the answer. So table data with the text of the answer, yes or no. Then we have the, the author, myself. Then we have the score of my question or my answer, minus three, because yes and no is not really a good answer. And then we have a final cell with some form, something for voting, let's make, let's just write some vote text here. Of course, all of this white space is optional in HTML. No? It's good for layout, but the browser will totally ignore the nesting and the indentation, and the white spaces. So we could also write all the HTML files in just one line, okay? If we want. This is just for readability. All spaces between one tag and the other are automatically ignored by the browser. Spaces between the words, of course, are retained. Okay. Um, and so in this case, we have a first line of the table. We can add a second one and so on. Okay, let's also add the second one so that we have something a bit more complete. So we had a second row, which is something maybe on the 1st of January last year or two years ago. Uh, definitely. Yes, and I'd say with Masala, it's a fanatic. It's a very smart. And so, 10, 20 points to his answer. Okay. So, basically, we, are, we have mostly most of the content except from the interactive elements uh, that uh, we plan to have in the page it doesn't look right but the content is there okay of course writing by hand is not something that we do in the in our real life but at least for, for having a feeling for it. So let's start applying some, some styling to this information, to this page. Let's, every element in, the, in, in a browser has a set of styles, a set of attributes that describe uh, is uh, appearance, how it looks like. And how it looks uh, means uh, the size, the color, the font, uh, the alignment, uh, the layout with, with respect to the other elements, and so on. Where are all these information stored? Okay, if you open the developer tools, so every browser as a menu with the developer tools. For example, here I have some, what is that? Web developer tools in, uh, in Firefox, uh, F12 uh, will just open it for me. And we can, 
and browse, uh, also Chrome and Safari, they have similar, and Edge, they all, they all have similar tools, okay? There's a, a capability for inspecting the web page, the content of the web page. So we have this inspector that shows me the HTML code of my page, and as I go through the elements, it will show me the corresponding part of the page. And also on the other way around, if I click here and I select uh, this text, it will jump me to the corresponding part of the code. So basically we see how our code breaks down into different uh, page elements. But the interesting part is that each of these elements, when we select them, as a set of properties that may be shown here. Okay, uh, a set of properties uh, that in, in this case they are the default properties applied by the browser. And uh, here I can, for example, uh, what is that usually, sorry, so. Each element that I select contains a huge, sorry, set of properties that are listed here. These are, these are sort of, so called the DOM methods and the properties that are uh, applicable. We will learn some of them, okay, next week. What I want to say now is that we, here we can see what uh, the elements are and can apply different styles. We can change all these properties. We can change them by okay, interacting here in the debugger, but uh, especially we can define some rules uh, to modify some of the properties. And we can debug them in this way. Later on, we will learn how to modify these rules also in, in, in JavaScript. So, for example, here we have a style editor where, where we can define CSS styles. So, what is what I'm trying to do is to introduce basically uh, the CSS language for giving a style to elements, different parts of the page. And CSS is made of a set of rules. And every rule is uh, of this format. The first part is a selector, and the second part is a declaration. And the declaration contains a set of properties. So it's a very, the, so the mental model is very simple. With the selector, we are selecting, highlighting some nodes in the page, some portion of the page. There are different types of selectors that uh, apply different uh, algorithms for selecting. And then on those nodes that were selected, we are changing, applying some attributes. Uh, for example, if we want to very simply add uh, some rules, uh, we can add a style attribute uh, in the head of the document that will where we can store some styles. Of course, normally, uh, when we have more than one style, we can put them into a separate file, but just for starting. Let's imagine we want to have all the titles in red. So what we can write is a CSS rule, a style rule. CSS and style are interchangeable. CSS stands for styling sheets. All the H1 elements, I want to write them into color red. So I'm selecting all the H1 elements in the page that are, in this case, we only have one. And I'm changing one property of that H1 node to red. Of course, I need to know which property to change. And if it works, 
I have the title, which is now red. The second title is an H2, and so it doesn't apply. The rule is not applied. Okay. Um, the application of the rules, of the selection rules, uh, works uh, on the tree of elements. And the rules uh, are applied uh, one on top of the other. So what if, if I want to make uh, all the text blue in the page, except for the title, of course. But it could add a second rule, which applies to the body, and set the color property of the body to blue. And what happens is that everything becomes blue except the title. So, what did we learn here? We learned that if I apply one property to a node, in this case body, that property is also propagated to the children of the node. So I don't need to apply that to P, to H2, to the table. I apply it to the body, and so it normally applies to the, all the children, except the, the, the ones that really find it. In this case, this is still red. Because I have a more specific rule that overrides the more general rules. So it's normal to have a lot of several rules that are in conflict with each other in a way, and the browser will resolve these rules by applying the most specific one at every time. So we can define general rules and then apply more specific ones to different sections or parts of elements of the page. For example, it could also apply a second uh, attribute to the body. For example, the uh, font family, let's make it uh, sans. So we are changing it to a lighter font and applying that to the body. And if I reload the page, I find that all the fonts change. So I apply the font uh, um, style to the body, and this is propagated to all the elements in the body, also to the title. Because every attribute is computed separately from the others. So we know that the color attribute is being redefined by in the title, and so this becomes red because it redefines the general rules that was color blue. While the font was defined at the body level, was, and it was not redefined at the title level, so we keep the general one. So this overriding is computed attribute per attribute, property per property. And this will lead, will lead to a lot of combinations of things that you can do. Hmm? Uh, other example, I could uh, change the main. We had a section that was called main here. So let's highlight it in some way. So maybe we could set a background color of this main uh, to a Azure color. In this case, we are coloring. Oh, sorry, it's not very visible in the projector. Let's make something less. Uh, let's bring, which is ugly to see, but it's mostly more visible here in the class. So we are changing one, pro so the body has a default background, which is uh, white, and we are redefining the background on the main element and all, and everything which is contained within. And so on. This is the simplest of the selectors in CSS which is called the element selector. Um, what is that? The element selector. The element selector selects all the 
nodes in the HTML page with the same element name. So P, div, span, uh, H1, whatever. The tags of the page. And we'll apply these properties to all these tags and their children, of course. This is very generic, okay? What if we want to change the style of only this paragraph and not of all the other paragraphs? We cannot imagine a different, a different tag for every part of the page. Some parts are just paragraph of text, but we want to style them differently. So we ha must have a way of marking a part of the page with some role, having some role, and applying rules specifically to those parts of the page. Yes? Sorry. Uh, yeah? Yes? Uh, for styling the table, yeah. yes, we will need to add a, a, lot, a lot of rules for styling the table in a nice way. Yes. So we'll get rid, get rid of the border and we set the borders and the spacing with CSS again. Okay. Um, would be a very long and boring exercise. And of course, we'll have, learn some libraries for doing that faster for us. Okay. But again, if we have two tables in the same page, then maybe we want to style them differently. So we want to have a more specific selectors than just the element name. So we can, in a way, mark this paragraph to be, be, to be different by this other one. So maybe this paragraph is uh, the title of the question. Let's give it a name. ID, question title, question text. We call it. And then for the second paragraph, we have an ID of the author name. ID is a normal attribute. In a, in a, we can add to any HTML node. And as the name suggests, ID should be unique inside the page. Okay, you cannot have two nodes with the same ID. So this gives us a way for pinpointing exactly one specific paragraph. So maybe we want the title of the question to stand out. So let's make it bolder. So we write a selector of type ID select. It selects the only element in the page that has the specific ID and is written with a hash sign. So in this case, it would be hash question text. And with this node, it only selects this paragraph and we said maybe the font weight uh, to bolder. Very bold. And so we sorry, reload the page, and we see that the question now is bold. Only that paragraph. We selected that paragraph using the ID. So we marked the HTML with an ID, and we hooked into that ID using the hash syntax. So this is a way of applying some rules only to one specific element. And if we want maybe to write, you know, in italic, the author of the answers, we have more than one. So we have two answers. I want to write uh, the author name in italics, for example. I don't want to have two separate IDs and two separate rules. I should be able to give um, a, a, a class category to some elements and uh, uh, exploit this element more than once uh, 
in the, um, in the page. So this can be done with, an, with another attribute which is called class. Class may be, can be the uh, responder. And I can apply it to many elements in the sense. So the difference is very similar to ID. I'm marking up some element. The difference is that, is that a class can appear more than once. An ID is only for one element. A class is for a group of elements. And I can apply rules to this group of elements using the class selector. And the syntax for the class selector is dot. So I can add the rule that all the elements with class name responder uh, should be in italics maybe, font style uh, italic. And this will transform into italics uh, uh, all the contents of the cells that have been marked with the responder class. In this case, there are table data. I could have a, a paragraph with responder and will apply the, to any element that has some specific class. Any element can have one ID and many classes, zero or more classes, if we want to apply more effects to it. Any ID can appear only once, any class can appear many times. These are just the, the basic selectors. There are more complex ones. And also these basic selectors have rules to be combined. For example, these selectors uh, can, can just have one or two separated by comma or separated by space or by greater or by plus, and they have different meaning. So in this case, it means uh, the comma means union, or select all of these and all of those, all of them together, let's apply the rule, and the, the comma. The space means to select, uh, for example, the paragraph inside the div. So if I have a paragraph which is not inside the div, uh, it will not be selected, and so on. We indicate the div that contains a p. So we select the father instead of the child. So there are rules for you know, describing which part of the page we want to match. So maybe only the images that are inside the table can be done. OK? And of course, the three main selector, which are element, ID, and class, can also be combined together. Uh, for example, here, I'm combining a an element selector with a class selector, h1.hidden. All the h1 elements that have a class equal to hidden are selected in this case. If I have another h1 which is not hidden, or we have another hidden element which is not an h1, this rule will not, will not apply. The, and then I will stop, the power of, no, sorry, I don't have it. It's not, I, I just have selection of life, I don't have that. The power of CSS lies in a, okay, a very small set of rules that are combined in a thousand ways, and there are more than 200 properties for color, fonts, layout, and so on, that we that you can uh, borders, uh, corners, uh, um, 3D effects, and so on, that you can apply. So the difficult part of CSS is basically learning the main properties that we want to apply to the elements to get the effect that we want. So maybe, as she said before, um, we want to style the table. Okay, what are the properties that we should apply to table, to, to TR, to TD, in order to get a table with such borders, with such backgrounds, and so on? 
Okay, there are. There will be probably 50 different attributes. We need to learn what they do, and then we can apply a value to that. Okay. Um, the, the last thing I want to tell you before the break is that, of course, we cannot work in this way with a style sheet embedded into the page. Okay? Okay, it's possible, but all the styles that we define will be local to that page. If we load another page, we need to redefine them from scratch. So it will be better to have the styles in a separate file so that many pages can load the same style file and have a consistent uh, style across the website. And of course, it can be done. You just have to create a file with a sense of CSS, styles.css. Move all these declarations inside this file. And I don't remember the instruction for loading that. It was some uh, link. I don't remember. I will search. Yes? Yes, thank you. Link ref equal to uh, style.css style role equal Equal to style sheet, right? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. And if something is wrong, probably. I should never do something in the last minute. Not yet. OK, don't worry. Slash of, of what? This one? No? Mm. No, because an element is. Okay, let's have a break. Let me sort it out. Sorry. I just want me to 30 seconds of Google, but I don't want all of you to let wait. As you know, we have template usually reuse. Okay, so let's have a, uh, some break and then we move to the layout aspects of style sheets, which are more complex.